So here it goes. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome to this event today, and thank you so much for joining us. And uh, to everyone from very different places and very different time zones uh, who have made the time for this event, I would also like to thank our four panel members who have joined us today and um, will be discussing about this topic today. Um, so this event is organized by the by the Center of Study of Democracy within the School of Social Sciences that has research themes that include gender and sexuality, as well as post-colonial politics, development, and emerging powers. There is an explicit focus on engagement with communities and impacting upon public debates around these contentious subjects. And India is one such region, which we'll be looking at today. Um, and this event is an exploration of the larger theme of homonationalism globally, so a term that was originally coined by just BFUR to explain the association between nationalists and members from the LGBTQ community. In some cases, uh, as we're seeing right now, right-wing nationalisms that would in the past dehumanize LGBTQ persons have now sought to reframe themselves and you know, appropriate and discipline LGBTQ movements. Um, further, Islamophobia is also by many instances of these uh, home nationalisms. So today's panel discussion will focus on the growing trend of homo Hindu nationalism in India, where there has been an attempt to label and pass right-wing Hindu government policies as pro-LGBTQ community, even though the track record of Hindu nationalism is, is resolutely queerphobic. Um, with that, I shall now hand over to Professor Dibesh um, to give us a brief introduction and, and take over from there. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna, very much for organizing this. I mean, I'll just give a brief background to how we came about to organize this event. This, organize, this event was supposed to be organized in March. And as you know, with COVID and pandemic, what happened was we had to cancel the event because it was an off, not offline event, but it was an on-site event, right? So we changed that. And it was prompted by various events that took place in India and also in the UK. And one of the events that took place in the UK was at SOAS School of Oriental and African Studies, where a few of my, a couple of my colleagues, people who might, you might know, Kavita Krishna and others, we had an event around uh, the rise of fascism in India and the, specifically with focus on human rights and rights to self-determination in Kashmir. And we were disrupted by a group called Gays for JNK, a group claiming to be gays for JNK because that group never existed before that or nor did it exist after that event. And that group, of course, accused us of being left regressives who are homophobic. Right. And of course, when we invited them to join us to have conversation, they never did that. In fact, I challenge them that I can bet that they are not queer. They are not queer for sure. Right. I don't even think that they would be LGBT of any kind, but they tried to hijack it because, of course, while in India, for Hindu nationalism to portray itself even as homophobic can work for most of the people. In the UK, they wanted to portray themselves as the victims and the sort of you know progressives who are being suppressed by so-called liberal left, which we as we know in case of India doesn't exist, right? But that's what they tried. So it was prompted by all these events where we could see that LGBTQ movement or queer movement, if I can use that term more widely was being hijacked by certain actors in India or in Indian diaspora that wanted to support and buttress and work more closely with Hindu nationalists rather than working against Hindu nationalists, which many of us would assume any queer should do, right? Now, that was the background. And of course, within our school and within our Center for the Study of Democracy, which Anna pointed out, we have been doing all kinds of work which are very clearly not claiming to be objective, not claiming to be balanced, but very clearly critical, very clearly those that promote democracy, that promote human rights, that promote freedom, that promote uh, rights of self-determination, that promote uh, the rights of uh, stateless nation, that promote all kinds of things that we should be promoting in academia. That's the broader ethos within our school and within our center. On that note, I mean, uh, we'll start, I mean, uh, well, Anna will say who's going to speak uh, next. I think it's a uh, Nishant, in fact, you are the first speaker next. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each speaker to introduce themselves, right? And that's better rather than to introduce you. So you can introduce the way you want to. So it would be first Nishant, then Joe, then Savi, and then myself. Yeah, Nishant. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I'm, I guess people can hear me, right? 
Okay. Uh, so hi, hi everyone. I'm Nishant. Uh, I use they, them, their pronouns. Uh, I teach at University of Colorado Boulder in ethnic studies, uh, and I'm zooming in from uh, not zooming, I guess, be being. Uh, no, that's that has many different meanings. Uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, I am in Denver, Colorado. Uh, these are the traditional territories of Ute, Shan, and Arapaho peoples uh, who've been. Uh, occupied, these territories have been occupied by the U.S. for a few centuries, and I start with this land acknowledgement because in the North American context, it's really important to to ground uh, ongoing colonization of indigenous peoples, uh, and that also is uh, really important in my uh, scholarship and activism that I do. And I think growing uh, increasingly the connections between settler colonial, ongoing settler colonial projects here in Kashmir are getting much and much more uh, clearer uh, if they had not been clearer before. So as I talk about colonization here uh, in uh, what U.S. is doing uh, uh, and to thinking about sovereignty and decolonization, it is deeply connected to uh, what India is doing in Kashmir and what is happening in Palestine and what is happening in Tibet and other places, right? Uh, and also to mark my own positionality as complicit in these violences uh, as someone who is an immigrant here, uh, how I am uh, part of the settler colonial nation state here well, uh, the ongoing settler colonial project in Kashmir, uh, complicit through my Indianness, right? So, uh, so that's my introduction. Uh, uh, I was gonna just uh, spend a few minutes talking about what Homo Hindu nationalism is. So, thank you, Anna and uh, Devesh, for uh, inviting me and giving us the context uh, uh, for, uh, for also talking about Jasveer Pua's work and then giving us the context of what happened at SOS last year, which was it is still very shocking every time I think about that, right? Like, this group of gates for JNK, uh, just uh, using identities and uh, mobilizing them for the nationalist project in India. So uh, as Anna said, uh, in, uh, in the last few 10, 15 years, we've been seeing a lot of uh, gay movements, queer movements, uh, aligning themselves with nationalistic projects, uh, be it the uh, uh, Israeli Zionist project or the US nationalist project or Canadian or British, uh, where certain uh, queer bodies become very comfortable in their nationalism uh, and the uh, and everything that that nation stands for, right? Uh, and these are mostly white white queer bodies that we will recognize them in the North American context or European and even Israeli context. Uh, but what has been happening in the Indian context is that in the last few years, uh, especially uh, after Modi coming into power for the first time, we've started seeing an assertion of Hindu gayness or Hindu queerness, which uh, aligns itself with the Hindu project of BJP and RSS, which is um, following the trends in uh, in uh, US, UK, Israel, Canada. It's not surprising that, that that's happening, but it's surprising because RSS and BJP until quite recently used to be very, very homophobic, right? Um, um, a lot of us in this room might know well, in the 90s when the film Fire came out, how BJP RSS literally came out on the streets to uh, to show their homophobia uh, and to uh, and since then consistently for for a long time uh, different people in RSS and BJP have uh, uh, made statements uh, which are which would be deeply homophobic. But in the last few years we have started seeing that a lot of people uh, have started asserting their uh, Hindu identities and ways to support the BJP and RSS uh, and saying uh, claiming that Hinduism has always been queer and trans friendly, okay, and HR friendly and uh, and whatnot, right? So people like uh, some some of you might know people like Ashoka Kavi, uh, Lakshmi Narayan Tripathi, Devdas Patnaik, these are big queer trans voices, uh, gay and trans uh, gay and uh, hitra voices, which have very openly started supporting uh, the Islamophobic uh, and Brahminical uh, uh, project of Islam, of Hindu tradition, right? So Ashoka Kavi has been in the scene for a long, long time claims to be the father or the mother of the gay Indian movement, uh, and for decades has been saying deeply, deeply casteist, anti-Dalit, and Islamophobic things. Uh, uh, Lakshmi Narayan Tripathi, who's, uh, who's a hijra activist, uh, has also very openly in the last few years been saying all kinds of things from uh, from supporting the, 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 the Ram Mandir in Ayodhya to saying that a uh, hijra battalion should be sent to Pakistan. To the border so that Hitras can annihilate the, uh, the nation of uh, Pakistan and just joining forces with Modi and RSS very openly. And people like Devdat Patnaik, who a lot of people might still say he's liberal, but he uh, and his work has been used in liberal urban uh, queer spaces for a long time to talk about queerness in the Indian context 
uh, which predates colonial uh, uh, colonization of the subcontinent, right? Uh, and, but increasingly, his, he's also been uh, making all kinds of statements uh, which align uh, with the, the Hindu, Hindu nationalist project. So these people, uh, and so how do we start making sense of it, right? Uh, and so what uh, the way I try to understand it is that these are people who are privileged through their caste positions and being Hindu, uh, they're all dominant caste. And so for them, uh, asserting their queerness and transness um, becomes a way of claiming uh, claiming a, a part in the Hindu Rashtra, right? And so even though we can say that these are yeah, Hindu Rashtra would be is misogynist, we know that, and would also be homophobic. But uh, because of their caste privilege, they can still assert assert their uh, identities and their positionalities uh, within the structure uh, which claims to which is deeply Islamophobic and deeply Brahminical and deeply believes in the occupation of Kashmir and uh, other parts of northeast of India. Uh, and so, um, uh, uh, and so, this is as the Desh said that this has happened. This has been happening in India uh, in like online queer spaces, uh, regular online queer spaces. Uh, every other day, there are comments made about how BJP is great and BJP is gonna be the savior and BJP is gonna bring same-sex marriage and gay rights and whatnot. Uh, and uh, along with the UK and the US too, this has become really, really prevalent. Uh, where Hindu groups, uh, right-wing Hindu groups, are using. Um, uh, now starting starting using the language queerness to talk about Hinduism being uh, this uh, queer friendly religion, and so there's a group called uh, Hindu American Foundation, which some of you might have heard about. Uh, they have been uh, for over a decade, more than a decade actually, uh, were fighting in California to change textbooks in California to uh, cater uh, to school textbooks in uh, California to change any time Hinduism is mentioned to remove references to the caste system or patriarchy or uh, religious violence uh, along with Hinduism. Uh, uh, and so they succeeded in 2017, a few years ago, where now textbooks in California uh, don't mention caste oppression or gender-based oppression or religious-based oppression when they talk about India and Hinduism. Right? So this is a, a group which has been mobilizing millions and millions of dollars um, uh, to create this very uh, 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 Hindu Hindu narrative in the U.S. about what Hinduism is, and that there are no caste issues or gender issues or religion issues in the religion. Uh, so while they were fighting for this to change in the textbooks, uh, they they aligned themselves with the LGBTQ group, which was also asking for changing the textbooks to have a much a uh, lot more representation of LGBTQ uh, peoples in the U.S. in textbooks. And so they made this one, at one time they're saying there's no caste or gender violence in India. Uh, at the other time, at the same time, uh, aligning themselves with LGBTQ groups to then claim that Hinduism has always been LGBTQ friendly. Uh, they, a few years ago, a Bangladeshi queer activist was killed in Bangladesh and they came out with a statement shaming Bangladesh for their homophobia. This is uh, uh, before the Supreme Court judgment in India uh, about uh, decriminalizing homosexuality, right? So homophobia is nothing, it's not solved in India by any means. But then to claim that Bangladesh is homophobic because they're a Muslim nation, uh, nation state, they 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 think they can make these statements, global statements, right? And they're making these statements on the backs of Zionist organizing around uh, their homo nationalist project uh, of claiming pa uh, Palestine read as Muslim majority to be homophobic and misogynist, and Israel read as mm. Jewish. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, as progressive and the only gay heaven uh, in, in the Middle East, right? Uh, so uh, Hindu right-wing forces are uh, learning a lot of tricks from the Zionists and white nationalists uh, in the US and Canadian context. So uh, uh, so in this this whole, the project then becomes that saying that Hinduism was always queer friendly, always trans friendly, uh, and that it was Islam and Christianity bringing a broad homophobia uh, into, into the country. Uh, and that before Islam and Christianity coming in, there was no problem around uh, queerness and people being gay or uh, and trans and hijra and all other words that we uh, we use for gender and sexual non-conforming peoples and communities, right? So, uh, so it's become it's this this is uh, it is still quite emergent, I think, this homo national Hindu homo nationalism that we are seeing, but it's really paradoxical and ironical because uh, BJP still uh, hasn't really said anything. Uh, um, uh, in favor of queer queer movements, right? So, uh, in 2016, India India uh, rejected a UN resolution for banning uh, death penalty for homosexuality. In 2018, the government dropped sexual orientation from both this discrimination policies. Uh, uh, in and just last month, uh, in September, the the government told the Delhi High Court that same-sex marriage was not permissible 
due to the laws recognized by uh, the legal laws recognized in the country. Right? So they openly come out and claim homophobia again and again, and yet their supporters, who I called gay bucks, uh, or saffron chaddis, uh, 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 or pink chaddis, uh, 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 that uh, they they claim that BJP is going to save them uh, and give them give them the rights. Uh, but the BJP is always maintaining that they're not really actually going to do much about this. Right? Uh, last year, with uh, everything that's been happening, with uh, uh, with everything that happened in Kashmir, and then uh, CAA and then NASI, in the midst of all of that, mm-hmm. a Transgender People's Protection Act was. Uh, or uh, was passed in 2019 December without much discussion and without much uh, uh, in the parliament and it just came out, uh, which uh, Greg Vanu, who's a Dalit trans activist, uh, is, has said uh, is, is, uh, is a death sentence for a lot of trans people because it denies uh, all kinds of uh, uh, things that trans activists on the grounds have been asking for for a long, long time. Right? So it doesn't allow for self-identification and self determination of gender, still uh, criminalizes uh, 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 sex work and begging, doesn't allow for positive information policies and whatnot. So everything that trans people have been asking for a long time, they have not um, they have not done that, right? And come out with this really, really transphobic and really, really violent and draconian act in the name of protecting trans people. So, uh, so this is just a big, uh, just wanted to give a context about how this has been mobilized and we can come back to it in question and answer on so people have more specific questions about these examples. But uh, I just want to, before I end, I just want to say four, four elements of homo-nationalism, Hindu homo-nationalism that I've been trying to uh, work through or uh, to, uh, to identify. Uh, uh, they are first that Hinduism is always queer and trans-friendly. So, Prior to colonialism, Hinduism was this religion that allowed for people to be who they wanted to be sexually, uh, sexual and gender identities wise. And it's Christian, uh, Christianity and Islam that bring uh, homophobia. Um, and so Islam then becomes homophobic and uh, Hinduism becomes this progressive liberal religion for forever. Uh, so that's the second point. The third point that Hindu, uh, dominant caste Hindu and queer folks, then uh, gay hugs can be included in this project of Hindu Rashtra as long as they take part in Brahmin cultural supremacy and Islamophobia, uh, and rendering then all other dominant caste Hindu others, so the Dalit, Adivasi, Bahujan people, uh, Muslims, Kashmiris, uh, tribal people, they're, they're simultaneously they're read as queer and homophobic, right? So they're, they're uh, the way because they're queer, because they don't fit the Brahminical cis heteropatriarchal norms of masculinity uh, and patriarchy, so they'll always be read as queer people, uh, queer. So Dalit men would always be queer, Kashmiri men are always queer through this lens, but at the same time, homophobia is blamed on them and put on their bodies, but Hinduism somehow is liberal and everyone else who is not dominant caste Hindu becomes homophobic. Um, and Kashmir has been very, very central to this. So uh, one of the reasons that uh, the, the reasons that the government gave uh, uh, with its official annexation in August was that now queer people can be protected uh, uh, in Kashmir because apparently they were not protected before that. But actually, the work that Kashmiri queer and feminist scholars have done has shown us that prior to this uh, shift in 2019. Um, uh, Kashmir actually did, the Kashmir constitution did not have anything on, uh, like 377 and so they did not have any language of homophobia in the constitution and with the reading down of uh, 377, Kashmir, the, that reading down also was applied to uh, Kashmir. So uh, the annexation in 2019 actually doesn't do anything to queer bodies. What has actually happened is that uh, through the annexation and the lockdowns, continuous ongoing lockdown that Kashmir Valley has seen in terms of uh, uh, queer and trans people and hetero people have been suffering under that because they've lost access to their communities, right? So Kashmir is very, very central to this now Hindu nationalist project. Um, uh, I think I have, have I passed the one minute or do I still have one minute, Anna? Um, no, your time is time is done, yes. So. Okay, cool. Um, so I'll just say 30 seconds. I'll just say uh, two things. Yeah, that's uh, right. that, my focus on the right, uh, I think the Hindu right becomes a very easy target to say the, uh, for, for those of us who uh, are in leftist progressive feminist friends. Uh, but uh, homo Hindu nationalism is not just limited to Hindu nationalism. I think the Indian left, uh, both in India and the diaspora, needs to also look into how we, we engage with Hinduism, especially those of us who are dominant caste Hindus, uh, and that we also replicate and reproduce all kinds of Hindu nationalist uh, uh, discourses within our spaces, uh, and that it's a lot more uh, difficult to critique because of how we have to make the Hindu Hindu extremists, the fascists, as our enemies to fight. But also, this is not just limited to them. The way 
what Dalit scholars and activists have told us for centuries now, that Hinduism is so much more, uh, Hinduism uh, does uh, dominant caste privilege and Hindu articulation by dominant caste people doesn't really follow, uh, uh, it's across the political spectrum, right? So left has been as complicit in casteist and Brahminical supremacy uh, projects uh, as the Hindu right is. And also uh, the last point is uh, to uh, that this is, uh, we have to uh, think about more critically about colonialism in this context. So a lot of people say that homophobia came through 377 in India and that it's a colonial uh, uh, colonial project. But uh, given how caste predates colonialism by centuries or caste violence predates that actually we have to rethink what we mean by colonialism in the South Asian context, uh, especially in the Indian context about how do we understand sexuality and gender, sexuality and gender norms are dictated through caste logics a uh, lot more than they're dictated through colonial colonial logics. So I will end at that and then maybe if there few people have questions we can come back to it later. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Next we have with us um, Joe who's going to be talking. Uh, okay, <laughs> go for it. sorry. Uh, yes, as Tibesh said, I'll just introduce myself. Um, I hope everybody can hear me in case you can't just drop a message and I'll try to be louder. Um, hi, I'm Joe, and I'm a PhD candidate at SOAS. Uh, today I am not talking about uh, the work I do during my PhD. Instead, I'm talking about much more personal things because I'm a queer and trans activist. Uh, so mostly in life, generally, I'm an activist and advocate for trans and queer rights uh, out of my doctoral work. And usually I find myself trying to merge the two together with my work and engaging with art and advocacy projects. Um, today, I'm going to add to this wonderful panel um, and all the ideas that have been shared about homonationalism by Nishant and the ideas that will be shared by Savi and Dibesh um, in, in terms of what homonationalism is, what it does, and why it is dangerous. Um, in my context, I will be sharing a few experiences to add to this discussion about why we should be careful and very, very scared about this steadily rising threat of pink washing and Islamophobia hidden under the veil of progressive ideologies within our uh, communities that um, we love so much. I mean, queer and trans communities. Um, first, um, I, would, I, would, I will be talking about my experiences being part of the larger queer community in Mumbai and the place liberal politics has in furthering the rise uh, in right-wing politics. And then I will be talking about our own organizing communities and sustaining the movement in a world where fascism only seems to be rising. Um, so to start with, uh, I've been a part of the larger Bombay and Bangalore queer communities a little before I came out at 20. Uh, it's been roughly five years now. I'm very small compared to all of the other people here. Um, and while I didn't want to be a part of a regional community as such, and I didn't expect to be, uh, I guess it just ends up happening because you work somewhere and all the connections you make happen to be around the same regional group. And we know that the um, localized groups are much more better to understand the needs of localized communities. And yeah, that's just a note about uh, regional and localized groups. Um, so my time in Bombay, within the Bombay queer community, specifically was embellished with the fact that I was also, just until three months ago, the editor of a very large uh, queer publication in Bombay. Um, as part of my work there in 2018, I was also involved in the creation of a queer zine that was based on the th theme of uh, collecting mythological stories and pulling out queer threads from these stories and illustrating them to sort of show that queerness exists and existed in age-old mythology. Uh, just like uh, how uh, Nishan said that that's that's basically the thing that a lot of us, uh, when you enter the queer community and you come out and you meet other people, that's one of the first strands of thought that you hear that, you know, 377 is what brought in homophobia. So we've all, a lot of people believe that um, mythology and, you know, age old stories always were accepting of homosexuality. And that's what this group believed as well. And me, I had just entered. Um, I was I also believed in that um, and while not all uh, the stories in the book were from Hindu mythology a majority of them were and a majority of them were also inspired by uh, Devdas Patnaik's books and his work uh, on Hindu mythology so this 
content that was created in 2018 with the idea that the publication was subverting notions of queerness and mythology is now in 2020 increasingly being misused by right wing people within the community and other right wing organizations to further the notion that hinduism has always been pro queerness um while queer homo nationalists have been using stories of popular gods like um you know krishna and vishnu to show examples of gender fluidity non queer homo nationalists usually don't say that a god is queer because that would be wrong um but just that hinduism is benevolent and patient towards queer people so that that's the kind of tone that is taken by queer nas- uh, homo nationalists and non queer homo nationalists um what i want to stress upon with this example is that it was made like this book or whatever project this was was made with the bestest intentions out there um but best intentions uh, when not critically examined can easily leave way for radically divisive politics to take place and this is exactly what happened uh, because we didn't think about what these stories were representing how brahmanical the stories we chose uh were and how they were constructed who they were representing how queer people were talked about really in these stories and the intersectional conversations around these stories we ended up creating material that is being used as information to further a notion that hinduism has always been pro homosexuality and this is far from true as nishan said um i don't believe i personally anyway don't believe any religious institution is accepting of homosexuality no religion willingly has uh accepted homosexual people or trans people we are continuously pushed to the margins and minoritized by every state every religion and every society so using this to say that one religion is more inclusive than the other so that more hate can be fueled to is, is a blatant use of this movement to further a right wing violent agenda um we aren't minority groups we are minoritized groups and it is unfortunate that we have fall trap to this idea that someone accepts us um but i don't i don't blame um those of us who think that there is hope all of us just want to find identity and family and a way to fit in somewhere um as queer people and trans people and for some people to know that the religion they are born into accepts them possibly gives them some sort of affirmation but not being critical of that religion and not actually thinking about what this religion actually stands for um i mean like with the sudden wave of acceptance from people who haven't been very accepting for the longest time is something we need to be cautious about and you should actually just like this i mean you should just dismantle um, hinduism currently because it's brahmanical but yeah there should be some space for reflection um and moving on to talk about how the brahmanical hindu state which is now suddenly priding itself over how pro lgbtq it is has constantly silenced voices that dissent i'd like to talk about early 2020 um when a close friend was arrested during mumbai pride for raising anti caa slogans during mumbai pride which through its organizers was supposed to be an a political event even though the the fight for rights of sexual romantic and gender minorities has been anything but a political The idea that pride would be a political and happy this year was created by a group of mostly upper caste uh, cisgender gay men in Mumbai. And after our friend was arrested, it took a very long time until bail was arranged, and not a lot of support was there. Um, and this in a space like Bombay, which is usually prided for our sense of community in the uh, our sense of queer community. and the history of a city like this with its queerness one would think that in a politically progressive space like bombay arresting someone on the basis of what they spoke about would be vehemently opposed but instead a lot of liberal groups stayed silent and watched while my friend who is also a trans person was misgendered and outed in media outlets instead conversations were still about how this was a complex issue my friend is not the only one who was arrested for a poster many trans people continue to get arrested murdered and marginalized in the so called pro lgbtq state we must fight for each other's right to protest and be political and there is nothing complex about this this also brings me to uh, my second point of discussion about organizing within marginalized communities 
I've been a part of a range of small size advocacy groups in India and London. And I feel like currently the only thing I want to do is focus on creating communities of care when we collectivize. Because unfortunately, within uh, many of these groups, I was also part of spaces that were either trans negative or had so much transphobia that was left unlearned uh, that they became really violent. And this translated into, you know, the grouping of the collectives and how the feelings of cisgender feminists were always valued over the expression and voices of trans and non-binary members of the groups. In many ways, these groups started recreating the paternalistic structures of violence that we collectively had hoped to run away from when we created these feminist spaces. Um, and Anna and I have been uh, writing, we've been working, trying to work on a paper um, to reflect on radical love in our communities. So um, the next bit is the concluding part of our paper, which I would like to use to conclude my bit on this panel. So I'm going to read that out. Uh, quote, offering critiques of communities that we are a part of and ha often have interpersonal relationships with is dangerous. Dangerous because of the ostracization the world meets out to communities that cannot paint a rosy picture of their struggles and ostracization from community members who have rigid ideas of how a community should function, who should have the voice, who should lead, who should be cancelled. It is scary to be on the margins and also to be on the receiving end of abusive, violent behavior. However, we also know that just because someone is marginalized, it does not mean that they are not capable of violence. By being paternalistic CIS, CERs, sisters, we end up recreating the same patriarchal structures found within heteronormative spaces. We can't stop someone from being violent towards another person, marginalized or not. What we can do is embody a practice of radical love as the practice towards liberation, which begins the, with critical self-awareness as, as the starting point. The goal is to ensure that violence does not reproduce itself in a structure that continually ends up shutting down the survivor of that violence. That is on us. We are meant to be safe spaces, safe people, safe events and safe minds for others of our community. We are meant to create worlds away from this world just because of how violent the current structure is to our communities. And in this world, how we deal with and how we accidentally embrace the abuser and not the survivor is how we enable the structure of violence. So, and like I often find myself saying, and I will end with that, that our movements need to be as sustainable as capitalism and fascism are. Over to you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, can I please invite Savi now? Okay. Um, uh, can I be heard clearly? Uh, yes, Savi, perfectly. Okay, thanks. Uh, do, do, do say my voice dips. Uh, just to introduce myself, um, I'm a, a Sri Lankan-born lesbian. I'm a writer, involvement coordinator, and LGBTQ plus um, and human rights mm. activist. Uh, I worked for the Black Lesbian and Gay Centre in London in the 1980s and 90s and have long been involved in anti-fascist organising uh, of one kind or another, as well as various other types of activities in various types of communities. Um, I will... Um, now make a, a few tentative suggestions. Uh, I'll be looking perhaps at some of the practicalities of countering the appeal of the far right. Um, and in this, I'll be drawing on the experience, on my experience of anti-fascist organizing here and working for greater democracy and equality in Sri Lanka uh, and conversations about and in India. Um, I, there may be some aspects that people disagree with, so maybe that will um, feed into the, the wider conversation. Um, and um, I think one of the, the big questions is about why the extreme right uh, might be so appealing, given its uh, track record and behavior. For instance, if we look at what's happening in Uttar Pradesh, um, uh, that it ta it's taking patriarchal power to absurd extremes in terms of control over women's bodies and romantic lives. Um, 
and in so many other ways the behavior of those in the Indian far right, uh, particularly some of the most prominent figures, has been extremely oppressive um, on the, the front of sexuality, gender identity, gender in general, and in all kinds of other ways. So many, many people have suffered at the, um, at the hands of um, the, those policies. Um, and um, in that context, I think it's looking at why the far right may still appeal to some people, uh, how this might be countered and um, what different people might be able to do because we are all in different contexts and um, what we're good at, whom we're connected with, where our voices might be heard may vary. Uh, obviously, there are some people who get class and other economic benefit from being lined up with, with the likes of the of the BJP, and in those circumstances, I can um, I can understand if somebody thinks that it'll help them make their first million or ten million or whatever um, to, to be aligned with the most reactionary forces. Um, if the, those will allow them to carry on. Uh, being LGBTQ plus behind closed doors, then they might be prepared to overlook some of the more unpleasant manifestations of, of that ideology um, and, and outright bigotry. Uh, there's also the, that glossy image um, and uh, the ability to kind of rewrite history so that suddenly the BJP uh, is portrayed as very progressive, whereas of course um, the, the Indian right uh, fought and fought um, against um, some of the, the progress that was made and some of the people who helped to drive progress are those who are currently being targeted under repressive laws. If they'd had their way, uh, those um, fighting for greater justice would have probably been silenced before, the, the, before even those changes to the law that have been made um, have the, the, I mean, the, in terms of progress uh, have been achieved. So um, it is, so I think there is, of course, that slick media effort, including on social media. And so that might explain some of the appeal. There's also the issue of status of various kinds. Uh, of course, caste has been mentioned and there may be other kinds of status too. But again, there are, the, I mean, the questions might arise as to why that matters so much, just as those questions will arise when we're looking at the rise of the far right in Britain today and various par other parts of Europe, where there may be governments that are quite openly contemptuous, for instance, of white working class people, uh, regardless of um, sexuality and gender identity, um, even of men, but still some may be drawn to that far right ideology uh, and it's our uh, and it's asking why people might be drawn to um to leaders who may actually treat them in fairly contemptuous ways um who uh, we've, we've seen this during the pandemic uh, in terms of what's happened to to a lot of indians and um uh, who do not owe their survival to, to the tender mercies uh, of those at, at the top um, even if, um, again, the, the pr propaganda effort has portrayed the government as somehow being benign and caring. Um, but we do know, um, oh, there, there is some evidence, I think, that authoritarianism can rise at times of uncertainty and people may be drawn to strong leaders, people who portray themselves as the, the father of the nation. This may include people who may actually find those kinds of relationships quite destructive, who may be um, in positions that might be quite targeted as uh, militarism and uh, patriarchy take a deeper hold, but who may nevertheless be searching for somebody who can rescue them and um, everybody else. Um, so we're faced with that, that tendency sometimes for people to be drawn 
um, to, to someone who can seem to offer a way out of a crisis, uh, even if it's a crisis that they've helped to create or, um, certain, or made worse through some of their actions. Um, there's the, I suppose, the appeal of far right ideology to some people and its ability to tap into both tradition, that sense of being connected to some kind of deep heritage, um, some connection with um, symbols that are attractive to people that have a resonance and modernity, that sense that you'll be part of this bright new world. And it may be a very violent bright new world that involves um, uh, eliminating the people um, who are seen uh, as getting in the way of uh, a truly modern progressive nation. Uh, and, and very often the far right has combined those two fairly contradictory uh, kinds of approaches. Uh, but some people have been drawn to that idea of efficiency um, and um, a, a, a sort of ideal uh, of progress um, at the same time as being linked to a past. Um, I think that ties into that hunger for belonging. And that's something that, for instance, the RSS has been very good at addressing uh, in ways that probably the left by and large has not. Uh, and obviously one doesn't want to create a kind of mass army of people who do as they're told and are, are drilled into conformity. But that sense of being part of a, a huge family uh, that will provide certain kinds of care, that will some sometimes do community type projects, uh, as well as doing more destructive kinds of action, um, that can give people a sense of connect connectedness and caring. That can be important to people, enough perhaps to overlook some of the contradictions, some of the, the threats behind the the benevolent facade um, and I think encountering the far right is maybe addressing some of the, those aspects, the insecurities uh, of the people who might be drawn to it and looking at um, what they might be getting out of it and ways of offering something that's better. Um, obviously people are um, extremely um, wedded to that, those kinds of views are unlikely to budge, but there will be a lot of people who are kind of sitting on the fence. Um, and those can be, I think, quite often won over, or at least one to a position of some neutrality of asking questions about what they've taken for, for granted. Um, all right, so in terms of some of the, the things that can be done, there's of course challenging the, the historical inaccuracy about how um, certain kinds of freedoms came to pass uh, that they weren't willingly pointing out that they weren't willingly granted and changing the climate surrounding for instance um, Indian people overseas so we can some of us can perhaps work on social media LGBTQ plus communities here um, being the community media platforms and websites uh, to, to try to, to keep pointing to the destructive nature of Hindutva, of the, um, the, the ideologies and practices of the Indian government, how these damage so many different minorities, ultimately uh, the, the majority of people, you know, the, the non-millionaires um, in, in that country. There's the, the child, there's getting that um, balance between holding on to high ideals and building alliances with a very wide range of people who are anti-fascist in order to counter, uh, counter the, the appeal of the far right. Um, there's contesting cultural symbols uh, where, where we might feel they've been misused. And here I will speak as somebody who's a member of a faith tradition. I'm a Christian, I'm an Anglican, and that's tied up with all kinds of, of imperialism as well. You know, imperialism, uh, colonialism, and all kinds of other isms and oppress oppressions, but there are people within that, um, within that tradition who contest that. And where there are those pockets, um, to, to move away from that notion that a religion is something that's coherent um, and singular and one set of people speak for it. It's very often um, a, a mixture of different kinds of traditions and some are more destructive and some are more creative and healing. So 
those of us who might be in those spaces might be might have a role in contesting that and there have been Hindus for human rights who have I think um, done some important work in um, annoying the, the BJP and questioning some of their um, their portrayal of themselves as em embodying Indian values and the importance of creating spaces of caring that might draw some of the people who might otherwise turn to the to the far right. Okay, that's um, that's it. That's just a few uh, ideas about practical things that might be done. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Savi. I'm now going to hand over to, to Professor Dibesh. Uh, thank you, Anna. And in fact, so I'm Dibesh. I'm a professor of politics and international relations at University of Westminster, and therefore I'm Anna's colleague here. In terms of introduction to myself, I mean, uh, I have researched on various topics, I've taught various topics, but one subject that's closest to my heart, which is my own queer identity, I have never properly researched, right? So my research has largely been about stateless nations, including Kashmir, Tibetans. I've looked at fascism, Hindu nationalism in India. I've looked at uh, identity politics, right? So I've done all kinds of research, except researching on queer politics. And there's a specific reason for that. Okay, there are two reasons. One is because I don't get time because I'm ahead of school, so I have to manage all of this, right? But the second reason also is because in a way, I. And it's an odd thing to say, but I want to not be influenced by many others. So I want to experience various things and have my own sense of queer theory, queer, queer politics, and then engage with other scholars. Right? So of course, I have engaged with people, I've engaged with scholars, but I've not read it, things consciously. That's what I've done. Right? Now, in terms of within the university, uh, I'm uh, co-chair of uh, Black and Minority Ethnic uh, Staff Network, Colleagues Network. I'm also co-chair of EDI, Net, uh, EDI Committee, all of this, right? So I have all these roles, which is highly bureaucratic. But what I've learned from that, of course, is the importance of engaging rather than disengaging. So I do sense, maybe, maybe I'm still under illusion, but I do sense that by engaging with processes of bureaucracy and process of authority, we can make some difference. That's my hope. So that's what I've been doing in terms of uh, work. Now, in terms of homo Hindu nationalism, I remember when, uh, I was, in fact, I was thinking of this term and I thought, oh, homo Hindu nationalism, such an important and interesting word. Then I Googled for it. And of course, Nishant, I think, was the first, first tweet of oldest post I saw with homo Hindu nationalism was done by Nishant. And that's how I, how I got in touch with them first, if I'm not mistaken, right? But anyway, so the idea was it came to this project and this idea came from my disquiet with which is a shared one with all of you is to what extent Hindu nationalism which is a form of fascism and LGBTQ movement in India they may or may not come with each other come together or even flirt with each other, right so there's an active flirtation but there's also conscious working and sometimes there's one-sided working so that's how it's functioning so the way for instance I would in fact a lot of what I want to talk have spoken about which is great so i don't have to speak about those things right now in terms of first i thought what is there in lgbtq movement or lgbtq identity not movement because if you look at how hindu national behaved they have actually avoided lgbtq movements right but they have tried to scavenge upon aspects of lgbtq identity so what is there in lgbtq identity politics that appeals to hindu nationals right so what's there why are they trapped one, of course, is they can use LGBTQ movement to then buttress the Islamophobia as somehow progressive, right? So the notion is by saying how they're free, they're friendly towards LGBTQ, they can portray to the outside world, not necessarily to India. There's hardly any attempt done by Hindu nationalists in India to portray themselves as LGBTQ friendly. For LGBTQ persons who have said, oh, they, are, they see Hindu nationalism as valid, right? But there are very few avoid ideologues of Hindu nationalism who have said, oh, they actually like LGBTQ movement. I mean, if you take example of Subraman Swami and others, they have still talk of homosexuals being diseased people, sick people. So they're, they're very clear about their homophobia, right? So, but still, from side of Hindu nationalists, particularly when they are outside India, they would try to appeal to LGBT movement to then say, oh, look, we have a common alliance against Muslims, right? So it's, it's through shared Islamophobia. So it's about almost a desire for acceptability. But there's a tension there. The tension is connected to the fact of largely Hindu nationalism being 
aspect of militarized masculinity right now aspects of particularly cis gay movement can also conform to ideas of patriarchal masculinity or even right or violent masculinity patriarchal masculinity but much of lgbtq movement would be seen as something that doesn't conform to heteronormative masculinity and this is a tension that hindu nationalism faces that on one side even if it claims that they are friendly towards lgbtq they'll always have a certain discomfort right they'll always be ambiguous now what is there in hindu nationalism that attracts parts of lgbtq not movement but persons right what is there one i would say is that some of your point accept uh, respectability acceptability we want to be accepted yes we want to fight we want to agitate but we also want to be loved we want we sometimes don't want constant battle i mean those of us who have been queer in one way or the other we know that the key challenge we face often not always is with families to be loved to be accepted so the way i would say is parts of lgbtq movement would be quite keen on even appealing to hindu nationalism because they would want acceptability they would want respectability now who did not give them acceptable respectability in the past in indian context the so called centrists the so called left i mean if we look at the record of the left and the right and the left and the right in the center in india much of it was homophobic for long time so we should not be shocked when if parts of lgbt would say look yes hindu nationalism is bad but so have others so have been others right i mean in the left not so much in india but even in a parts of the world large parts of the world i mean we do know that most communist party ruled states have been homophobic on even when communist parties are not actively homophobic they would present the idea that yes this is unimportant gender struggles are important sexuality struggles are important class struggle matters we know that there is aspect of that even in the left right so attraction towards hindu nationalism could be towards acceptability respectability to be included that in india they see hindu nation as the rising movement so why would they want to be excluded they want to be included but ultimately it's also about scapegoating scapegoating where rather than them being the target us being the target we find another target of fascism and those targets are largely muslims and christians and communists to an extent right and again if we can focus on islamophobia but those of us who have studied and have studied hindu nationalism in greater detail from very big the very clear that the enemies are islam church and these are terms they use islam church communists secularists right these four and they are very clear that all four are enemies of course muslims are number one enemies right now so therefore say first muslims and then christians and communists also together so we have to bear in mind that they are these things right now what does it lead to so let's say there is a flirtation between aspects of hindu nationalists and significant parts of lgbtq uh, groups in india what does it lead to it leads to some partnerships to to an extent but largely it leads to strengthening of hindu nationalism right so it doesn't moderate hindu nationalists it strengthens hindu nationalists but it actually weakens queer so this is a kind of asymmetrical partnership even when there's a partnership where it's a hindu nationalism that rises and becomes stronger right and it's a queer movement that gets divided right that gets weakened now what it leads to of course is then the solidification of state project which is an old project as even nishan earlier pointed out that what uh, hindu nationalism do is not exceptional hindu nationalism is not an alien force within indian nationalism which is largely or significantly or completely brahmanical and as significant as uh, hindutva has been there right where hinduism is a fascism or sorry where hindutva is a fascism of course they are very explicit about what they are doing right? there is no compromise there so solidification state project means things like in you know, the uh, uh, the post i have from facebook that i shared is about oh from kashmir to kanyakumari india is one right so that kind of thing that basically it's about solidifying the nation state project which is largely hindu state project right now the question then is if this is what is happening in india and and i know joe said that you know some people like hope i like hope by the way but where does hope come from how to resist this kind of appropriation of one by the other and one by the other where we recognize that largely queer movement that will go down and the uh, hindu nationalism that will go up right so it's there is to keep conversing keep chatting keep talking keep resisting but for i say how to resist i say how not to resist 
how not to resist is by straight splaining like man splaining straight splaining right the reason it is straight splaining is because i as a queer person if let's say even even if a progressive straight feminist or progressive straight uh, minority rights activist or, or whatever activist they tell me that oh look at these lgbtq people they are flirting with hindu nationalism that's so bad my question would be yes but what are you doing about homophobia in whatever you're dealing with so where do we find for instance uh, my, yeah. so minority rights activists who are very complicit with deep homophobia at every level i would not take much talk from them i would say that how not to do this includes not patronizing all kinds of minorities including lgbt so the way we are critical and we should be critical of lgbtq movement for flirting with hindu nationalism we have to be critical of straight movements that might be minority rights movement of other kind including religious minority rights movement for being homophobic or not challenging homophobia it's there so how to resist i would say is the owner should not only be on lgbtq persons the owner should be on everyone to fight it should be on intersectionality and we'll use the intersectional term here right is how all kinds of oppressed of the hindu nationalists have to work together come together it can't be that we only look at and patronize one group and say we let somehow we have to protect them and save them because they are the main targets of hindu nationalism we have to work together and therefore and in the end recognize that of course being queer has never been about identity alone it is about it is about process and what we need to do of course therefore is recognizing that queering is about process we need to continue to agitate we need to continue to love we need to continue to hate i hate fascism so we need to continue to hate fascism i guess right we have to continue to agitate and continue to challenge hindu nationalism challenge queer phobia challenge islamophobia challenge, challenge anti semitism challenge sexism challenge all forms of bigotry wherever we witness it until unless we are willing to do that hard work i'm afraid we would not be in a good place thank you very much uh, thank you so much tipesh and i think there was a really insightful conversation and we uh, all four of you really connected very with each other's points as well providing a very comprehensive understanding of of what's going on um within hindu homo nationalism and how uh, queer groups are organizing around it um i would want to open up the floor to floor for questions now so in case um yes i, I was just going to come to that so uh, if you would like to speak please raise your hands and i can um, call out your name and then you can go ahead um if not and you if you would rather just chat uh, use the chat option to uh, give your question that's also perfectly fine i'm happy to read them out for you um so supraja would you want to please go ahead um um hi i don't think i don't know if you can see me but i see all of you uh um, okay hi hi <laughs> that was a fabulous talk by all four of you um really glad i stayed up tonight to listen to this um so my question or comment more so it 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 goes to all 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 of you in fact so um it's more to do with the manner in which um i think professor upadhyay's scholarship with sandeep bakshi has been where they're looking at the manner of articulation of queerness in contemporary times per se and the way that we keep borrowing from the west with regard to um, terminology or jargon and by doing so there is this sense of a displacement of temporality with what was what were the names for our queer ancestors for our uh, people so to speak before uh, colonialism um so there's this one huge debate that's kind of taking over um contemporary queer movements right now uh, where you see people like say for instance anbu iswi um and they're talking about how the term women women with the x right has been historically for sure has been historically um uh, discriminatory exclusionary to people who don't identify as farms people who would rather not be part of that uh, part of the spectrum or such but i also wonder here uh for instance farm theory um and and also the whole category of womanhood with the x again it's largely put forward through an onus in the global north 
mainly because of trans trans farms being the most uh, marginalized or the most hunted or the most violated but over here you see what of what was spoken with the whole shikhandi maneuver i think jason fernandez calls it that with with the rooting of uh, the identity of queerness in indian culture through the hijra figure right so the the most visible here is the trans farm so so is it in so my my comment or my question and and these are my musings as well in my own scholarship is it in response to this or or is it in response to the fact that uh, so many articulations of queerness for instance the koti or the kinnar or the aravani or the tirunangai get eclipsed by the hijra figure and, and what would be your um, your comments your takes on that and yeah Uh, any of the panel members who would want to take take up the question, please go ahead. Should we collect questions or should we respond question to question? Uh, so we don't have any questions in the chat right now. So um, you, you had questions. now we have three questions. How about we answer this and I'll make a note of the questions as they come because I didn't note down this entire question. So yes, please go for it. Nishant, you can. I, start. I can. Yeah. Thank you, Sapraja, for that question. I think that's a really, really important question. Um, thinking about all these different layers of how, how do we articulate queerness and also fight different forms of hegemonic uh, uh, hegemonic constructions of gender, sexuality, and transness, right? So, uh, so I definitely agree that I think the figure of the hijra uh, does take over in terms of uh, uh, erasing different uh, uh, regional identities and different linguistic caste, Greek, religious communities across across the subcontinent, right? Um, uh, and uh, I think that's why uh, Joe's comment about regional specificity, about where we are, where we are located, and how do we fight from those positions is really, really, really important to think about the local context, right? Uh, so uh, I think the figure of the hijra. I don't think hijra is necessarily themselves, but the figure of the hijra is is made hegemonic, right? So it's not. I don't think hijra people have that kind of power uh, uh, in any states, uh, any uh, structures in the Indian context, but uh, the figure is mobilized. And the figure of the Hijra is also globalized, mobilized in the global north, that that becomes the only example in the global north that people use of non-conforming communities, right? So if you take any gender studies class or gender sexuality studies class, Hijra is the only example that pops up uh, in, in, in the global north, right? And so I think that's also problematic because Hijra is then subsumed by the idea of what who trans friends are. As you said, the transness becomes a language of uh, displacing hijras, and then hijra becomes a way of displacing other regional identities. So um, I think this is a really complicated question, and I don't think we have answers to that. I think people have been asking this in terms of gen uh, how do we mobilize identity from the global north, um, uh, be it gay and lesbian in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and then queer, and now trans. Right? So trans is becoming a word which is very imperialist uh, uh, when it comes from the global north to global south and then in the Indian context. Uh, I think with caste and class privilege and urban privilege, a lot of people are using trans as a word uh, to identify. I use non-binary as a word, but non-binary in Hindi means nothing, right? Uh, that's my 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 native language. Uh, and so when I say I use they, them, their pronouns, in Hindi there's no way because they, them, their pronouns gets mobilized as a casteist and classist project, right? Uh, with the plural in Hindi, uh, so uh, and so I don't want to use that in Hindi. So uh, and and yet, non-binary is something that gives me a lot of meaning in my life, uh, and gives me uh, uh, there's gives me a lot of lot of gender affirm affirmations that I do need on a regular basis, right? But in Hindi, I'm, uh, he uh, the masculine only becomes the the way to articulate. So I think the question of language and imperialism and hegemony are, are very important. Um, but also, I think what uh, what I think uh, we uh, you you also alluded to it like when we use history as a way pre-colonial history as a way to then justify contemporary identities is also a colonial project. Right? It's a casteist project and a colonial project. And so in in this all this messiness, I don't think queerness can queerness and transness can never be universal and can can never be articulated and it becomes individually how we want to choose to. Um, and uh, I think. There's meaning in that. There's meaning in individually for those of who get uh, marginalized to these intersections of queer and gender identities uh, to use that, but also 
they can't be used for other people, right? So my non-binary, uh, and I use this example a lot, like uh, what non-binary means to me, no one has an understanding of what non-binary means. Non-binary, only a non-binary person who identifies as non-binary can tell what their meaning is. Like all other non-binary people have different meanings of what that means to them, right? And yet, um, the word is important for me, uh, and um, and but I can't impose that word on anyone else, right? Uh, and so similarly, in the Indian context, I think, um, as much as we can fight Hindi and English hegemonic powers uh, and regional words and identities can be used and maintained is important. But at the same time, this is a fight going on for, for centuries, right? And then I'll probably keep going in terms of what language is the way to express ourselves. So I don't know if I answered that question, but I think it's just, I don't think I have answers to that question. I think it was a question that uh, will, I think a haunting question that will keep haunting us for a long, long time. Okay. Um, Dibyash, did you want to add anything to that? I guess uh, as an aside, rather than uh, to add to this, I was just thinking of how we, we often read news reports re in recent times about how Iran is so good in transgender community rights and Pakistan is amazing when it comes to transgender community rights. We read more and more about this. So the idea is being gay or lesbian is perversion against faith culture and cult uh, faith and culture. But trans, of course, is connected to certain identity, which is some natural and therefore it's acceptable. So it depends on the context, again, as Nishant and others pointed out, very much depends upon in different contexts, which what we would consider broadly as LGBTQ plus, right, which identity can be seen as acceptable so long as they know their place, right? And that's very important that they know the place, then places at the very margin. Otherwise, broadly speaking, I mean, then this context matters a lot. But there's something else which context matters, but we also have to acknowledge that in most parts of the world, including here, I mean, history is one of queer side, right? It's based on erasure of our bodies and our identities, not bodies and identities. Now, when we look at definition of genocide, genocide is not only about massacre of people. It has been about complete erasure of identity. If we take that example of genocide and think of how queer people have been treated across history in different different contexts, you find that basically civilization is one of queer side. Anyway, that's it. So uh, I'm sure there are more questions. So. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dibesh and Nishan, both. Um, do the other panel members have anything to add or I'll move on to the next question? Yeah, I had like one tiny point because um, I, I don't again, like I uh, don't have any scholarship on this, so I wouldn't be the person to speak about it. But like what I would say is that, yeah, just like agreeing with what Nishant was saying, um, I identify as an agender person. Like I do not know how to explain to my mom what that means because there is no language that uh, she's going to understand to understand what the agenda means for me but yeah so i've taken that word and it makes me feel good so i use it and i feel like the only way to deal with um, the language that has been given to us or we have borrowed i think it was both is we take it and then we actually dismantle it to see what it means for us because um, i mean at least I've, I've tried to do that i have this project called almari where we dismantle what the closet means because honestly like even in india we would not call an almari a closet we'd call it a cupboard or like wardrobe or something so we wouldn't even call it uh, um, a closet so i think when we sit and dismantle why we think what we think how we think i think that could be a good way to look inwards because uh, unfortunately a lot of us our queer identities are you know have made us activists even if maybe somebody doesn't want to be an activist they just want to live their life but they have th that's what uh, marginalized identity does to you and um we are constantly forced to talk outwards about ourselves and sometimes we just don't make those spaces for ourselves and i think when we make spaces for ourselves also we will be able to slowly like yeah a lot of things are necessary this thing is also necessary <laughs> Um, thanks. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Sam? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, very briefly, that um, I, I think it's worth remembering that identities change over time, even in a particular part of the world, sometimes very fast, and who might be considered most oppressed or in what ways or in what and in what situations. Um, but I think that um, one constant is that with authoritarian states, they um, keep them, they, choose, they 
claim the right to decide whether we are acceptable or unacceptable, what we're mm -hmm. allowed to do, who, who people are allowed to be. And ultimately that leaves us always vulnerable. Um, dependent on their either their patronage or or them overlooking our transgressions if we're regarded as breaking their rules. So there is that common interest in overturning the, those kinds of power relations that um, claim the right to decide who people are and uh, what we can what we can do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Savi. Um, so we'll take two questions now from uh, Anish and Sonia. Uh, please uh, direct whomever you are asking the question to, and Anish, you can you can go ahead now. Hi everyone, thank you so much. I don't know if you can see me, see me and hear me, but thank you for this panel. This was really really incredible. I think the question I had was sort of drawing upon uh, the basic point of homo nationalism and Hindu nationalism flirting with each other, and to ask where they're going out on dates. You know that what is the apparatus of Hindu homo nationalism. And I want to say this in particular because I think there is a certain organized structure that needs to be studied in detail. Because Joe, you know, like in at Mumbai Pride, because Joe mentioned this, it seems so long ago, I forget that it was still this year. Uh, it only took 24 hours for a video to be taken, for it to go viral, for a former BJP MP to file a complaint of sedition, and then for a former chief minister to uh, tweet this out and make it a news headline. And these things don't happen by coincidence. And there's clearly some sort of infrastructure that's operating. And at a time when we are being surveilled at an unprecedented rate, I was one of the people called into the police station because my name was on, a, on those permits and they had phone records of who I'd made phone calls to and questions about whether I was hiding um, a friend. And when there is that much surveillance, on us, how do we turn that around and examine the structures that allow for this homo-Hindu nationalism to operate, which often go unseen. And conversely, because it's so ironic, right, that that very same day after Mumbai Pride, a bunch of us were at Mumbai Bagh, where the anti-CA protest was going on. And the same bunch of folks who also ended up being involved in uh, responding to the ramifications of what happened at Mumbai Pride and it became a space of incredible solidarity, a space that eventually also led to a queer and trans led um, protests in Bombay and Delhi and Calcutta that also led to um, sort of an event at Shaheen Bagh, which sort of um, highlighted queer and trans voices. So I'm wondering how we can think of the apparatus of uh, homo Hindu nationalism and how we can respond to it and what the structures that we build and the spaces of resilience that we build can um, do and can create in ways that tackle your point, Dibesh, right? That of other marginalized communities not responding to queer phobia within themselves. And how do we generate these learning spaces for an example of going through the same shit together? Sorry, that was very long. Oh, no, it's absolutely fine. Thank you. And thank you so much for, for sharing as well. Um, can I please ask? Sonia to, to also ask their question. Hi, um, sure. I actually had uh, like a comment and a question. Um, I, I'll try to make it really quick. Uh, thank you so much for the uh, for the panel. It was really informative. Uh, I'm sorry I came in late, so I missed a lot of the beginning portion of the panel. But um, I am um, I, I just want to push back a little, uh, and I'm sorry again if this was touched on in previous presenters. But I wanted to push back a little bit on this notion of um, like a queer queer identities being about um, like I often find that queer queerness gets discussed in this very individualized way while uh, it it is less this less uh, evident how it is both a structural and systematic and political process as well and i want to like of course um, like i think when i think about hindu homo nationalism the most immediate uh, example that comes to mind is of course kashmir right how the lgbt movement is used in kashmir in very obvious 
organized ways um, and uh, by multiple uh, stakeholders, right, including queer people. But there are other examples, right? I think, and, and I think for me, it at least begins with um, Ruth Vanita's work, how Ruth Vanita's work has been uh, so influential in creating this idea that queer people were super free back in the day when, um, when uh, you know, this make India great again narrative. Right. And then, like, uh, you know, I, I don't back when Ashok Ravi's politics was less obvious, his uh, trash uh, conceptual framework around hijras and kothis and HIV has been really influential in forming a lot of HIV pro pro programming and interventions. All of this has been uh, led and sort of uplifted by queer people. Right. And um, so I just wanted to say, kind of make that comment that there are this, these kind of ways in which uh, there has been uh, like works and sort of sanghi saffronization within the queer movement, embedded in the queer movement in a very kind of uh, beyond just identities. Right. Um, and a lot of it is the like the caste is neat, like the abs complete absence of discussing caste or how caste plays a role. Uh, but the, my, my question relates to how you think homo nationalism or Hindu homo nationalism specifically has been uh, upheld by the HIV industrial complex in India, like how the HIV industrial complex has really helped uh, helped along the more obvious ways in which we see Hindu nationalism right now. Sorry, that was long. <laughs> no, that's absolutely fine. Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, I'm also going to read out Omer's question, which is, what is the role of right-wing populism? How it is articulated? Um, how is it articulated within the Hindu nationalism or, ju or justified within it? Omer, I hope that is, that is a correct reading. Just let me know in case you have further questions. Um, and... Uh, for Dibesh, there is another question by. Uh, uh, right, I can. I'm yes. That question, eh? Okay. Okay. Perfect. So I'm going. Um, since we are also now running out of time, as happens on most of these events, I'm going to invite all of the panel members one by one to kind of give um, their viewpoints on uh, both the questions raised and also Omer's question, if that's possible. So, um, would anybody want to volunteer to go first? I just see a lot of people. Okay. I can, I can, yeah. Please, and, please. No, I was offering someone else to go first. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm over yeah, yeah. OK, let me but, go first and right? answer all the questions. Right. So in terms of uh, when it, oh, yeah. uh, Anish, I mean, thank you a lot for the, uh, the verbal question. You're right. I mean, it's not simply coincidence that there's a flirtation taking place and, you know, what's happening. It's very structured. So, for instance, the gaze for JNK thing, which uh, I was mentioning at SOAS, right? So imagine that there's an event on, on SOAS. Fine, there are people who want to disrupt. That's okay. They can come and disrupt. But it's very rare for any disruption to happen within the UK where it's so organized that within seven minutes of that disruption, it's on Indian television. So what happened was, so imagine that these masked people, they came and took banners gays for JNK, they disrupted us. My colleague Nitasha, you come and talk. Kavita said, well, remember you are, your Hindu nationalism is homophobic, and I'm saying, I'm queer, we shout, whatever, and then they go. There's, and within six months, I my phone started, you know, it was not allowed, it was on silent. I had a journalist writing to me, what is happening? Can you give us an interview? I said, what interview? Because they were already telecasting it in a broadcast in India. So clearly, this was, I don't know, Abhijit Ayer, one of the so, uh, Twitter person, right? So they were saying how proud they are of gay brothers and lesbian sisters for doing this. Now, how would they know what had happened? Until and it was planned. So you're right. I mean, much of it is planned. And in UK context, they deliberately would portray themselves as queer friendly and portray others as non-queer friendly, right? Now, the challenge they faced vis-a-vis -vis my presence was I was the only one who's visibly queer and you know, open queer and in the panel. My name had not been announced. So they would not have known that this event, which they're claiming to be homophobic, is actually chaired by an openly queer person, right? That I found later. So essentially, something along that happened there. So you're right, it's about structure. They do put us under surveillance. They observe what's happening. They'll not use homophobic language here in the UK, but they might do it in, the, in India. That's what 
So they are very well planned because Hindu national, as we know, is based on a structure. Modi may come and go. He may die soon or he may get disappeared soon. Who knows? Hopefully he gets disappeared. Well, we have been recorded, but that's fine. It disappearance is good in certain contexts, right? They have disappeared too many Kashmir. They deserve to be disappeared themselves into national. So it disappears. But it will not solve the problem because, of course, fascism is Indian context, Hindu national context. It's not a product of Modi or Adityanath. It's a product of RSS. Really. And it's a very well organized movement. Now, what is happening in recent times, the way I would say is them reaching out to our Hindu nationals, sorry, queer, mostly gay men and some trans people, but mostly gay men of privileged background reaching out to them is because they know where this is where the power is moving. My sense is if the left came to power today, a strong communist government in India, the same activists would start the left because a lot of time, you know, people move towards power and that's what i think may happen but anyway who knows uh, in terms of sonia you're right i mean all i would say to is you're right. a lot of time when we talk of queer movement queer identity we end up talking of our experience because often it starts with because of course we experience it so that is experiential but i do agree with you that it's also about collectivity that it's also about structures that we need to study it's about institutions which you have not been very good at studying but we need to be good at studying it right and now in terms of as on HIV industrial complex, I'll not say much because I do I have not researched on it, right? Now, in terms of Omer right wing populism, yeah, of course, uh, Hindu nationalism is right wing populist movement, but this is an older right wing populist movement than most right wing populist movements in Europe. So, if you think that uh, you know, Erdogan, what he's doing is 20 years old, I mean, Modi's he stems is a product of a movement that's almost uh, well, almost 100 years old now, right? So we have to bear in mind, therefore, the ways in which right-wing populism in india is more than right-wing populism it is a form of fascism that has a deep root based on institutionalized organization and mobilization that's what they're very good at now in terms of uh, gabriel uh, thanks again you like i mean negotiating identities be it around queer but also race ethnicity is a very complicated process where we you we, we might be appropriated for one identity but excluded for another right so some movements say, oh, you're queer, join us. Oh, but you're Muslim, out. Oh, you're Muslim, join us, brother. But you're queer, sorry, you're not Muslim then. Right? And we know, I mean, I'm just seeing Muslim example. It can happen to any other identity. So this is a challenge in the West, but also in the non-West. I mean, uh, Joe Nishant and others have pointed out and others have worked on it. And even Anish's work I'm aware of. The ways in which caste plays such a crucial role in terms of LGBT movement in India. Anish, you're right. I mean, you look at, it's not new. What they did with the Article 370 and what happened with, I mean, it's a continuity. The, in a way, they made it more visible what they had already been doing. But when we look at these movements, which are claiming to sort of bring LGBTQ flag, right? Pride flag in Kashmir, the reality is they're not Kashmiris themselves. So this is a typical example of coloniality, where we, impose our ideas on them right so that's how it is so they would want to liberate kashmiri lgbtq by imprisoning all all Kash, all kashmiris including lgbt can you know a lot of you have worked on it yeah, yeah thanks for sharing that article i'm aware of it but in this context i mean this, and i'll be I'll, I'll, I'll add it it will add to what i was saying that how not to resist right so for instance I have been working on solidarity with Kashmir and Tibet and everything else, right? And I'm very openly queer. But the kind of backlash I've experienced, even from some Kashmiris who would appreciate my solidarity, except they'll go silent when I'm being attacked for my sexuality, right? So for me, I mean, and I'm just saying it openly that I, I mean, I will not tone down my queer identity because one or the other identity is being suppressed. For me, I have solidarity with all kinds of movement because I am queer and I will not tone down. So when we look at, for instance, uh, work done around Kashmir or even Kashmir, when I in Kashmir, we find critics of pink washing, we find critics of homo national, which we are doing, but we also find, of course, Ajaz and others have worked on it, but we all have to be aware of a number of LGBTQ Kashmiris based in Kashmir, who have disquiet with Hindu national, who have disquiet with India, but they also have disquiet with the extreme enforced silencing that goes on within their communities. And sometimes they are the ones who reach out to you or me or someone else, right, and say, what should we do? And the only thing, sadly, someone like me says is, keep silent. 
and we will get out, which is a sad thing to say, right? But the reason I highlight this is because, of course, what we're talking about is right now homo Hindu national, which we need to critique the way we critique Hindu fashion, but it's also important to critique all other forms of queer phobia that exist in different parts of India. Anyway, sorry, long, long answer, but I'll keep quiet now. Uh, I can, we can't hear you, Anna. Sorry, I did the classic mistake of muting myself. Uh, thank you, Divish. And I wanted to ask Savi if you want to add something, or would you like to say something? Uh, no, nothing. OK, uh, thank you. So we have, we're going to take two last questions from Ashita and, and Abraham after, and I would request all the panel members to again give their views on that, and we'll, we'll have to um, end the event after that. So Ashita, if you would like to go first, and then Abraham, you can, you can go ahead. Thank you, Anna, and uh, thank you everyone for such an amazing panel. Um, this was really uh, great to hear uh, right now. Um, my question actually is for Joe. Uh, so Joe, uh, in your segment, you mentioned that uh, uh, as a part of the queer publication in Mumbai, you published some zines that were further used uh, to, uh, to propagate the project of Hindu nationalism. Um, my, so, I just wanted to know if you could just uh, shed some light on your process of reflection, because it's clear that over a period of time, you've kind of reflected upon this project that was made with the best intentions, however, was used for to to kind of almost oxymoronically for for a, for Hindu nationalism. But also, is there some like do you think there's something inherent in this uh, in in this kind of idea of glorifying our mythology that uh, that naturally lends to to Hindu nationalism? Um, yeah, just just your thoughts on these. Thank you, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, for that, Arshita. Um, Joe, I'm going to request Abraham to also ask okay. their question. Then then both, uh, everybody can answer. Abraham, please go ahead right thank you very much uh, i mean starting off from where savitri had uh, earlier said of how you know religion uh, for example uh, is not uh, you know there's no uh, one set of uh, views uh, you know uh, that a religion can espouse and that is not sort of the dominant position you know while keeping that in mind you know uh, and going uh, towards what the was saying uh, over how a lot of kashmiri people uh, are quite uh, blatantly silent whenever he's been bashed or attacked for his uh, sexuality. I was just curious if you could talk about uh, how religion comes into play when it's actually not uh, uh, specifically Hinduism uh, in India, because I'm from Pakistan and of course uh, in Pakistan or even Bangladesh, I can't imagine how, uh, you know, something uh, along the lines of decriminalization that happened in India is even, you know, um, in any way possible over here you know we just don't have uh, any uh, sort of pathway even available to us uh, at the moment and so i was just interested to find out that in the indian context uh, you know i do think it's quite interesting that you know this whole uh, indian uh, uh, hindu tradition which sort of is uh, welcoming towards uh, sexuality uh, was sort of uh, used and you know is there what about the other sort of religions in terms of uh, say islam and christianity uh, how do uh, and maybe perhaps joe could talk about because she said she's quite you know uh, uh, involved in the sort of mumbai bangalore queer community how is religion ever uh, seen as a marker of identity amongst queer people and uh, if so how does it sort of play out Okay, um, thank you, Abraham, for your question. Uh, so I'm going to request all the panel members to make their final concluding remarks, and we can we can start with Joe since the earlier question was was for Joe, and then um, I'll, I'll go on to the rest of the panel members. Yeah. Okay, Joe. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Abraham and Ashita, for your questions. Um, I'm going to try and keep my thoughts. <laughs> together in one place um so talking about the reflection about the zine um unfortunately 
or fortunately, I don't know. The zine happened when I just joined the organization. So I was not in a place where I could have stopped it. Um, I was just telling my partner today that, you know, I was going through the zine. I have a copy. So I was just going through it again. And I was like, if I was in the position that I am now, three years ago, and I knew as much as I did now, I would not have let that zine be published because I know the people behind the zine and they did not expect or... Like, I feel like they, like, I just feel like we, I wouldn't even say they, we did not reflect enough to understand what we were doing because all of us came from pretty Savarna places, um, upper class people, dominant caste people, upper caste people. Um, yeah, so I, I, I just don't think that we should have done that. Um, my, my personal reflections definitely would be that the reason I couldn't see it, one of the reasons I couldn't see it when I should have uh, three years ago was simply because I'm a child who grew up in Islamic countries. I was I was uh, born in Bombay, but I was I've grown up in Sharjah and Riyadh, and those are not places I could explore my sexuality. So when I came to India to do my journalism degree, it was it was like rainbow in my face because <laughs> everywhere there was there was. Here was this country where people were walking on the streets for pride and Bombay has one of the biggest prides. So for me, it was just like, wow, everything was wow. And that's the case with most young queer people. And that's what happened with me as well. And because I come from a dominant caste, an oppressive caste, I, I, I should just say that, come from an oppressive caste, um, who like we've been like my parents have been pretty much Sanskritized to believe they are on higher on the caste system that they than they are actually or whatever. And I've always been fed this extremely um, chest beaty idea of nationalism that diasporic you know communities are already fed because in the, in the diaspora we are basically taught to uh, um, I mean, sing the national anthem 50 times more than children in India are anyway, because we are supposed to be doing everything into 10 times. So I think that's where I came from. And that's why I did not know what was wrong with that. And it took a good five years of reflection to come here. But well, if it happened to me, it will happen to all of us. And we will learn to be better and understand the what we need to dismantle because that, that's not okay. Um, yeah, so totally take uh, responsibility for it. And about Abraham's question, I think the only thing I can weigh in on is whether uh, religion plays a part. Well, I wish it didn't, but as we see, it does. Um, I think it does more at this time than it used to earlier. It's just grown to be, yeah. I th and actually, I, ju I just feel like all of us were anyway Islamophobic. It just, there was no space for it. It's just like when Trump came, all people who were anyway, um, I don't know, Islamophobic and xenophobic, they just found a voice. So that's the only thing that happened. It's, it's been way long happening and going. And my, my grandfather still thinks Hindu khatre mein hai to. <laughs> so yeah, I'm still working on him. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Joe. And can we have Nishant? Sure. Uh, those are really, really great questions uh, and really, really thoughtful responses from Devesh and uh, Joe. Uh, I'm still thinking about the question Sonia asked about HIV uh, work and uh, now the, the structures that we have for homo Hindu nationalism. And I don't really have an answer for that. Uh, uh, but I think I can uh, connect what Anish was also talking about uh, and Abraham's question as well to uh, it was from what I understood, what I what I heard was that after the Mumbai Pride, it was people like Ashok Rao, uh, Rao Kavi taking snapshots of people's Facebook and then sharing it to the cops, right? Like I think that is the structure. That is the structure that's laid out that people like Ashok Rao Kavi have access to cops and to uh, politicians and can work work that network, right? Which people who are on the left, we don't have that kind of structure, and we don't aspire. Mostly, don't aspire to those structures either. To work in sync with the cops, but I think, uh, and I think Sonia's question is really important in that 
uh, Ashok Rao Kaveen made a platform through doing that kind of work, uh, through doing, uh, uh, was involved in those, uh, uh, what's the group? Uh, what's, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the group that uh, he's, uh, he's been involved with. Uh, but uh, uh, Hamsafar Trust, yeah, right? Like in Hamsafar Trust, like getting all, all kinds of money and funds that they get to do HIV kind of work, uh, then joins in with uh, with uh, with, uh, with RSS and BJP networks, right? And so those are really important connections, I think, that have to be said. And I think a lot has to be also be said about HIV organizing that how uh, it allowed for a platform for MSM kind of uh, organizing uh, uh, recognition with through NGOization of these community spaces, uh, and that a lot of people who are running these spaces, uh, a lot of them came from feminist queer radical spaces but also a lot of them came from ngo structures which are always before as all, so many, all, all of my panelists have said like modi is not this this is not a modi issue right this is pre, predates modi and so a lot of these players who are involved in state structures have always been islamophobic have always been brahminical uh, and uh, and i think there's someone has to write about that how hiv aids organizing has led to homo nationalism uh, I think that's a really fascinating connection. Um, just to also think about um, um, uh, what Anish was also talking about uh, after the Pride, uh, that how different solidarity groups came, like what happened at Shaheen Bagh, uh, and how uh, there was, um, I think, uh, in a few different cities, there was a queer women, queer trans pride uh, marches that happened, and they under the banner of uh, Savitri, Savitri and Ambedkar's name, right? And so Jai Savitri, Jai, Jai uh, Bheem, being a rallying crowd around bringing women and Muslim, um, women and queer and trans people across caste and uh, religious backgrounds, I think that's something that none of us have seen before. And I think so as much as violence has happened in the country in the last year and has been ongoing for a long time, that these solidarities are coming up where in Shaheen Bagh, trans women could be on the platform and talk about their connections to, uh, to the struggles of women who were there, who we would associate as being homophobic, right? And as much as homophobia does exist in all kinds of, um, uh, all kinds of communities, not just Hindu communities, but also yeah, across, across uh, the region and the re uh, religion and ethnicity and caste, uh, I think that uh, what we what has happened through mainstreaming of Hindu nationalism has been that people like groups like the Queer Muslim Project or Homo Chinki Project or Dalit queer and trans uh, folks who've been so visible in last five ten years who've pushed these conversations who've made people like me with Dom and caste privileges accountable to our caste uh, caste um, mess and fuckery that we 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 we, uh, we live with. Uh, I think there's so there's so much happening, right? So even in Kashmir, I, yeah, uh, there's homophobia, but there's also people like Jave Mam who can come up with a slogan ragra ragra and have have a space in in Azadi movement, right? Uh, there are people in the northeast who are fighting for their trans rights and queer rights along with state oppression, Indian state oppression, right? And so uh, and Muslim queer folks, uh, all of these in these uh, marginalized communities are coming out uh, and asserting those identities too, right? As in the face of homo Hindu nationalism. So I think as we talk about the rise of homo nationalism, we also need to be acknowledging all these different uh, communities where queer and trans people are taking leadership and making these very deep intersectional connections and solidarities with each other, right? Uh, and to the point about uh, uh, decriminalization of homosexuality in the Indian context and not maybe perceivable in Pakistan and Bangladesh, I think a lot, it 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 obviously has to do with how Hinduism was used. And I think Sonia's point about, um, um, what was that woman's name? Uh, the, uh, uh, the one who came with same sex, uh, Ruthvanita, yeah. Right, I think Ruthvanita laid the foundation. Ruthvanita has done more for Hindu nationalism than any other queer person has, I think. Right, and they've done Patnaik built up on the empire, uh, on the work that Ruthvanita has done. Uh, and so Ruthvanita needs to be held accountable. Ruthvanita is not just a queer woman, uh, but so someone who laid this foundation to make Hinduism liberal, right? Uh, without ever talking about caste in her work, even though she had these sources from Islamic traditions and Sufi traditions saying in those in that book, but I think it laid the foundation for what uh, Hindu nationalists have now, or homo, uh, gay, gay sankhis or gay bhakts have now, right? Uh, so, but along with religion, what also was happening in India, I think a political economy question is very important that we didn't really come to in the panel, that Indian Indian economy being one of the biggest in the world, uh, that there's a lot about this liberalization around queerness, 
is a lot to do with that, right? It is about making Indian market much more bigger for for Western pink dollars to come into the country, and so it's a new liberal. Uh, so I think there's connections to be made between new liberalization of the Indian economy, rise of Hindu fascism, and rise of gay rights. They all three go together, right? There's very important synergies that have happened in that that Indian economy uh, being one of the largest because of its population. Uh, uh, that these things can also happen simultaneously, right? And that, uh, and so it's not just about Hinduism being uh, the carrier for that, because I think gay rights movement, uh, for all the flaws that it has about being centered by a, a dominant class urban English speaking cis gay men, uh, they were also mostly coming from left politics as Islamophobic, as casteist and classes they were, right? So it was the push came from them uh, for this this platform now, but it was the also the new liberalization of the Indian economy that's uh, uh, that created that avenue. So thank you, I'll stop there. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Nishan. And can I please ask Savi to, either reflect on the questions or offer final concluding remarks. Um, I'll start by reflecting on, on the question about religion uh, and uh, maybe expand a, a bit. I'd say that across different religious traditions, um, very often there are differences uh, in time and space, but that very often um, both in terms of religions and what are regarded as national cultures, uh, there can be claims made by leaders that what is a particular culture at a particular time or what might serve their interests somehow reflects um, timeless truths. This is the way that it's always been. Um, yes, Mus Muslims have always been against X and Y and Z or Christians have always forbidden this um, and, and so on. And, and you get this rewriting happening. Uh, in a lot of countries, uh, leaders, for instance, of uh, former colonies um, have taken laws that um, were introduced, for instance, under British rule and which were largely ignored in those countries, um, perhaps a few decades ago, and turned these into somehow uh, a form of national identity and a, a poor, important marker of uh, of, um, uh, of of nationhood um, and, and very often this is a, a sort of a, something of a disguise, disguise while th those countries might, while those leaders may actually be hand in glove with multinational corporations or whatever uh, or with um, major powers they will claim that as a, a claim patriarchy uh, homophobia transphobia as somehow defending national cultures um, but those cultures actually do change, religious traditions do change. It was interesting reading um, in the, the House of Lords debates about changing the law to decriminalize gay sex um, as, it was, uh, as it was discussed in the 90s and 1950s and 60s in, uh, in the UK. Uh, I think one peer uh, sort of in, in some ways lamenting how uh, repressive attitudes were in Britain compared to the comparatively free attitudes towards gays in the Middle East, which is not something people would necessarily say today, but it's perhaps a reflection of the fact that, um, that change does happen. And sometimes things go backwards and countries become much more hostile to LGBTQ people and towards minorities in general and women and people who are economically disadvantaged. But it can also work the other way and within religious traditions, within cultural traditions, within local traditions, there may be resources that people can draw on to help in struggles for, for justice and in deepening what they might regard as a, a spirituality for, for life, uh, that protects the life on, on the planet more generally um, and resist, resists forces that damage and harm it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Savi. Um, can I please ask Professor De Beers to also offer final concluding remarks? Yes. Uh, uh, thanks again, and I'll conclude and I'll sort of thank all of you, including Anna, for organizing this. Right. So that's that. I'll go last. So in terms of, I'll just make some comments. Uh, in fact, uh, what Abraham raised and what uh, Savi was earlier talking about the ways in which, for not some, for many, faith remains a crucial resource which they draw upon to make sense of life. Right. Now, for someone like uh, someone like 
ex-religionist, atheist like me, I don't get it. But it doesn't matter whether I get it or not. I'm sure a lot of straight people don't get what my desires are, but that's fine. That's their problem, not my problem, isn't it? So the reason I this is because we do need to acknowledge within LGBTQ theorization slash movement in general that faith remains very crucial for people and therefore we should not be I mean from my emperor we should understand why some will appeal to faith right including problematic aspects of the faith which we'll see the so people interpret text as a this is not the text means this is not what certain God meant this is not what prophet meant this is not what uh, is written in particular text right that's that's part and parcel the reason i'm saying it because of course we do know and i'll say that prejudices they're not born prejudice we are made into prejudice people right bigotry is not born it's like it's made like everything else so what a lot of people have been talking about here is that even when let's say i give example of my example that's specific right for instance i'm very openly queer and whenever I, in Kashmir context, it is a specific context. When I would talk about humanity, I would talk of not human, I would talk of azadi, freedom, there's a lot of appreciation I receive from many Kashmiris. So I don't do it for appreciation. It's not about how they respond. I That's my duty as someone who shares Indian occupying colonial identity. But the moment I talk of queer, I could see the harsh or selective silence, selective picking up. And what I found, and I'll say this, the sub strongest support I found in my solidarity work was from largely older people, religious people, including who I call my Kashmiri mother, Parveen Ahanga. She's religious, they're religious. She may not use the language, okay? she'll not use the word queer, but she accepts me for who I am. The challenge I find, and I have to say it, or hypocrisy or the silence I find is from, supposed those who use the language of progressivism, those who use the language of feminism, and yet go silent whenever they see a Kashmir or a pro-Kashmiri queer person being up. So yes, you're right, Nishant, the, the whole notion that one trans person, ragra, ragra, it's being used and it's selectively used. But we also know the ways in which the queer identity of uh, the, what is it, the father of uh, Kashmiri poetry, right, is erased. Most people will not know, they'll not talk about it, right? So this is what I meant. So, and we know that in Indian context, it's very particular. So our, those who identify Muslim, I'm not saying those who don't identify Muslim, but queer Muslim, they get attacked for being a lot. I think they're not Muslim. And of course, they get attacked for being Muslim. And this is something which all of us negotiate. So the way I would say, is, for me, hope lies in recognizing our different struggles, not patronizing one group versus another. And you're right in a way, but I think Sonia pointed out about how particular aspects of LGBTQ in particular assist the gay men need to apologize and acknowledge the privileges we inhabit and it's important that we apologize but also do more than apology. because there's always a risk of apology I find with British American context which is they just apologize and move on right yeah we apologize and now what's that now we have we feel so much better right my approach is more than apology let's do something more and I am also looking for a day I mean look we I, and this is I'll end with like I, homo Hindu nationalism, you know, I, we talk of uh, homo nationalism. I have a disquiet with homo nationalism thesis also. I haven't articulated well, so maybe give me some time. I'll do it. But what I find, of course, awkward there is that there's a complete, there's a focus on why certain authors we should not read because they were racist, they were sexist, they were misogynist, they were slave owners, right? How many times are we, do we talk of queer phobia or very explicit homophobia of Franz Fanon, for instance, right? Or for that matter, many other scholars with, who are otherwise radical. So for me, why should we have different standard when it comes to queer erasure of queer identity as opposed to when it comes to erasure and suppression of other forms of identity? For me, therefore, to conclude, the reason for this is we need to keep challenging prejudice. We need to work with each other. And we may disagree on something, which is fine, and we may agree on something. But do it on basis of class, because something which those of some of us who are in our most of us here, I'm sure, inhabit queer identities, we might find that a lot of it is hardly any support. It becomes individualized partly because there's not much support, where a lot of us appeal to these straight people who become saviors and whatever to help us, right? So what I'm saying is 
hopefully through this conversation, what we get is we challenge fascism, we challenge Hindu fascism, we challenge all forms of fascism, we challenge all forms of prejudice. We learn to work with each other and recognize that until we work with each other, support each other, love each other, take care of each other while disagreeing with each other, there's not much progress to be uh, made. Hopefully that's the start. And thank you to all the speakers for taking time out. Right? I wish we could have invited you to London and we could have gone out or oh, drink if you drink, if you don't drink, that's fine. I'm not drinking these days for a uh, borderline diabetes reason, not because of any other reason. Right? We could have met, maybe not now, but later. We'll carry on and I have to say thank you to Anna in particular for persisting and organizing. Thank you to all the speakers, right? And I have to say even people who made comments like Anish and Sonia and Abraham and, you know, Omer and everyone else. And those who not even, didn't even make comments, that does not matter. Thank you so much. We'll carry on raising the flags of anything that is not anchored by nation state, right? And form the fashion. So other fine comes of flags, right? On that note, thank you so much, really. I want to give you virtual hug. It's only virtual hug, nothing else. You have to be careful, but that's it. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you for joining in and staying until now as well. And thank you to all the panel members once again for taking out time for us. Yeah. Yeah. And we have recorded. We will put it on YouTube and share with you. We'll share it. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, one uh, more. Uh, audience can go, but you know, the speaker there.